There's a moment in Amazing Spider-Man issue 14, which oddly enough was the first appearance of the Green Goblin, where Liz Allen yells at Flash. Peter is a dreamboat. He's sensitive, intelligent, articulate. You probably don't know what those words mean. This f***ing voice. This is pretty wacky because she's one of the original people that picked on Peter Parker back in Amazing Fantasy number 15. She originally loudly declared, Peter Parker, he's Midtown High's only professional wallflower. But now she's engaged in a love triangle with him and another beautiful girl. As a result, as I was reading through these original Stan Lee Spider-Man comics, something blew my mind. You know the common assumption that Spider-Man as a persona is nothing but a miserable burden that does nothing but wreck Peter Parker's life? Yeah, no, that's wrong. It's actually a lot more complicated, and Stan Lee's original work will show you why. <laughs> Stanley's original 100 issue Spider-Man run is pretty expensive. It covers his high school phase to his university phase, from his first love to his many loves. And unlike the Raimi movies, these stages are at the forefront of Peter Parker's life. Okay. They shape everything from who he's with to how he relates with his own actions. True. So how the hell am I going to organize this? Well, this first study will examine the first 33 issues, which covers the entire high school phase and a bit after that. Oh. And in order to give this video a standalone theme, I'm going to specifically look at Spider-Man as a psychological persona and how it matures Peter Parker's psychology. As Irvin Goffman argued, Mask represents the conceptions we are formed of ourselves, the role we are striving to live up to. This mask is our truer self, the self we would like to be. In the end, our conception of our role becomes second nature and an integral part of our personality. We come into the world as individuals, achieve character and become persons. What a great bloody quote. For Peter Parker, this is all literal. His journey as Spider-Man is built on the conceit that the persona offers him an opportunity to redeem himself and to pursue more rational goals in life over his childish teenager needs. So let's examine what message is supported here in these original comics. And along the way, let's highlight some of the big differences between these comics and the movies. Oh, don't forget step seven. Step seven. Don't do any of that. Alright, I've already analysed Spider-Man's first appearance in Amazing Fantasy number 15 in one of my early terrible videos. So let's instead start with Amazing Spider-Man issue 1, which is comprised of two stories. The first introduces Jonah Jameson, who argues, The youth of this nation must learn to respect real heroes, men such as my son, John Jameson, the test pilot, not selfish freaks such as Spider-Man, a masked menace who refuses to even let us know his true identity. Spider-Man then ironically saves his son, however Jonah Jameson still spins for the story against him. Stanley has said JJ is based on himself in a very humorous way, but it's also obvious that he's a clear character of Frederick Wortham. For anyone who's not familiar with American comic history, he was a super conservative psychologist who argued comic books caused childhood delinquency and superheroes were terrible role models. He said Batman and Robin were gay boys and Superman would inspire kids to not follow their parents because they would seem so unimpressive in comparison. <laughs> However, his research didn't really follow basic social science standards. Like, he didn't mention how his population sample were mainly children with severe psychiatric disorders, or the fact that he actively distorted their statements anyways. He's a bit of a plonk. Therefore, Jonah Jameson has two functions. A, he helps establish the theme of rebelliousness because he symbolizes how unrelentingly unfair the older generation is with the new. And B, he enhances Peter's relatability in the mind of its intended younger readers by anchoring a broader setting that approximates reality. So you can see why the MCU went with the Alex Jones parallel. The controversial news website, the Daily Bugle.net. There you have it, folks. Whatever, back to the story. Spider-Man is stressed. What do I do? How can I prove I'm not dangerous? How can I convince people that I wasn't responsible for the failure of that capsule? Everything I do as Spider-Man seems to turn out wrong. What good is my fantastic power if I cannot use it? Or must I force to become what they accuse me of being? Must I really become a menace? Perhaps that is the only course left for me. Keep this massive speech in mind because it sets up how susceptible Peter Parker's self-esteem is with outside influence and it's a bomb that's eventually set off in issue 50 in a very far from home kind of way. The second story features Spider-Man trying to settle this question by getting a job with the Fantastic Four, but he's told it's a non-profit organization and leaves in frustration. However, the FF totally wanted to help him. Too bad he left so suddenly, perhaps we could have helped him. 
I really hope my neighbours can't hear me. Afterwards, the chameleon disguises himself as Spider-Man to break into a museum and after a confusing scuffle, real Spider-Man just angrily leaves and mumbles. Every time I try to help, I get into worse trouble. Well, they can catch that spy themselves now. And the police just catches chameleon anyways. As a result, Spidey's constant failure is established very early on as a joke, an expected and yet subversive punchline against the flow of the typical superhero heroics. Stanley has often said that Peter Parker's stories are often akin to Woody Allen performances, where you can relate to him but with enough distance to still point and laugh at him. Well, I always thought if Woody Allen were a superhero, he'd be Spider-Man. His Aunt May won't let him go out to save the world because he's not wearing his galoshes and it's snowing out. And uh, the funny thing is, I started doing that as a gag and really to keep myself awake, you know? So expect Peter Parker to marry his daughter at some point. However, underneath the facetiousness is a carefully laid out dramatic story. Peter Parker is from an unflattering and unfair world run by old people who wants him to be as unremarkable and passive as them but he actually belongs in the young and more vibrant superhero world. Therefore, his destiny, if you will, is to actualize his membership by letting go of this impatient frustration that he was raised in. He's designed to mirror, presumably, how the reader feels. Furthermore, this is anchored by the fact that within these first 30 issues, the Human Torch is actually more of a role model than even Uncle Ben, for the reason that Uncle Ben is only like mentioned three times. In issue one and the annual, he's used to re-explain Spidey's origin for potential new readers, and he's only passed referenced in issue 28 on Peter Parker's graduation. Whereas Johnny Storm is like a major supporting character that Peter Parker originally idolized. Ability alone isn't enough. It's one lesson I've learned from my partnership with the Fantastic Four. It's almost as though he's talking to me. Even the Fantastic Four have had defeats, but we always come back. Our motto is never say die. He's right. By golly, he's right. I want to thank you for that speech. I will never forget what you said today. It's meant a lot to me. Uh, huh? Oh, sure. Sure, uh, glad you enjoyed it, fellow. Hmm. I'm pretty sure I've mentioned this before, but Uncle Ben in these original comics is not the Sam Raimi Jesus figure who says, with great power comes great responsibility every five minutes, which in itself isn't really accurate because it, it, th that line came from a non-diegetic narration box in Amazing Fantasy issue 15. Instead, Uncle Ben is treated more as a simple storytelling marker that separates Peter Parker's life from before and after he gained inspiration in the superhero world. One of the best examples is in issue 5, where Peter Parker contemplates leaving a kidnapped Flash to his fate. What a break for me. The FF will never agree to Doom's terms, so all I have to do is keep out of it, and Flash will never bother Peter Parker again. Things are finally going my way. Oh, what am I thinking? I could no more sit back and let any harm come to Thompson than I could swim to the moon. The real Spider-Man will have to go into action again. You probably noticed that Spider-Man as a persona, as an identity, is treated as a separate idealized entity. Something that is not validated by memories of guilt, but is supported by the standard of other superheroes. Like how it is in the MCU, but instead of being measured by Tony Stark, it's the FF. I just wanted to be like you. Therefore, Spider-Man is less of a burden here, but is more like a form of self-therapy. Peter Parker reviews his life and moves forward with greater independent ambitions. <laughs> Speaking of the MCU, another point I want to bring up is how comedic these early comics are. They don't feel like dramas, they feel like sitcoms, to the extent that if you treat each issue like a burger, which is, I don't know, it sounds a bit weird, then the superhero plot is the patty. The two buns keeping it together is a workplace sitcom and a school sitcom. For example, in issue 12, the third Dark Ark story, just after Peter Parker's life gets back to normal, Dark Ark kidnaps Betty and demands Spider-Man and a photographer to meet him on Coney Island in order to vainfully publicize his victory. JJ obviously sends Peter Parker and he shows up as Spider-Man, but he gets beaten up and even unmasked. You think this is going to be a massive dramatic payoff, but no, Betty, Jameson and even the police just sort of brush it off. I should have known, it isn't Spider-Man, it's for that weakling brat, Peter Parker. Peter, he did it for me. Oh, he might have been killed. The fool, I ordered him to take pictures, not try to be a hero. You mean you knew Octopus was here? I, yeah, I am giving myself a headache. Afterwards, the school starts talking and Liz Allen absolutely loves Peter Parker for this to the extent that she starts following him around, trying to get his attention. As a result, an irritated Flash begins to follow her around and Peter Parker is just totally miffed by these two idiots. I am so far beyond high school right now. Parker, 
Later on, Spider-Man fights Dark Ark again on a roof, which gets Jameson soaked, and when Liz Allen finally gets a chance to talk to Peter Parker, she asks if he wants to go to a party, and he declines, while taking the opportunity to make fun of Flash again. Now then, Peter, what I wanted to ask you was, I'm having a party tonight, and sorry Liz, no can do. I've got a date with a certain little brunette tonight. Even though she may not know yet, I'm sure Flash would be happy to go instead of me. Although I know how boring it must be to have to use all those one-syllable words when you talk to him. <laughs> anyway, you deserve each other. Why that crummy? Don't say it, Flash. We rated that after the way we've treated Peter. Another example is in issue 17, when Flash opens a fan club for Spidey, but ironically he doesn't let Peter Parker join. Liz schemes a way to get him in, while ironically Peter is like totally disinterested. Then a stream of just the wackiest stuff happens. Spider-Man accidentally interrupts a film set like a fool, Betty Brand gets jealous of Liz, Jameson hates how the fan club is advertised in his newspaper, Johnny Strong blindly gives Peter Parker an autograph of himself after stopping a burglar, Spider-Man fights Green Goblin on the fan club stage while everyone thinks it's a performance so they're cheering, Human Torch joins in which makes Flash get really mad, Spider-Man has to keep switching back and forth to avoid suspicion, which causes Betty Brand to be sad when she sees him with Liz. Then Spider-Man has to leave to attend with Aunt May causing everyone to think he's a coward, leaving Flash, the guy who always picks on Peter Parker every day, as the only guy left ironically defending him. What's the matter with all of you? Are you just fair weather friends? Spidey must have had a reason for what he did. Okay, go ahead, walk out. Who needs you? I'm staying, I'm not a deserter. Oh, Spidey has one fan anyway. Nuts, what's the angle, Flash? Is he a relative of yours? <laughs> what is it with you and Spider-Man? He's just awesome, okay? The point I'm trying to make is that there's a light-hearted and playful wit to these comics, where the tension between Peter Parker and Spider-Man's world are mainly not a source of serious drama, but for ongoing gags. And I can't stress this freaking enough. It feels like a sitcom. JJ will get mad at Peter Parker, but will predictably get his mind blown when Peter Parker brings in new pictures of Spider-Man, fighting whatever that month's villain is. During Peter's dates with Betty, she'll get jealous of Liz flirting with him regularly, which then causes Flash to get jealous and make fun of Peter Parker, but then he's always hit by a witty comeback that he can't follow. As a result, it's pretty much tonally the exact opposite of the Raimi movies, because it's Peter Parker's personal life that's funny. It's often a consequence-free world that solves itself quickly, while it's the Spider-Man side that is serious, filled with mysteries and ongoing consequences that just keep building with people like Green Goblin, Frederick Fosworth, Crime Master and Big Man. The villains are usually not people who can attack the entire city, but are working class guys with plans to rob something. He must be Peter. Yeah. And more importantly, unlike the Raimi movies, they're not disposable. They always come back, and it's this messy groundedness that makes it so serious and engaging. So in other words, Spider-Man Homecoming really doesn't get enough credit for capturing this very specific, often overlooked tone. It's comedy vibes for Peter Parker. You can't just quit on us, stroll up, and be welcomed back by everyone. Hey, welcome back, Peter. Flash, you're back to first alternate. What? And oh shit stuff with Spider-Man. And when people criticize it for that, they really need to get their Frickin' heads checked. However, Peter Parker's life after high school feels dramatically different. It begins to feel more like a melodrama than a sitcom, and this is where clearly the Raimi movies drew most of its inspiration from, which is super freaking weird because now high school feels like university, so then the shift between high school and university doesn't really mean anything, and that means Peter Parker's whole central arc is completely different, and you know what, I'm just gonna let the evidence show you what I mean. The first story arc set in university is issue 31 through 33's If This Be My Destiny, and it mirrors the situation of Spidey Strikes Back from issue 17 to 19, which at that point was the most dramatic story. Both three issue arcs features Aunt May going to hospital due to an illness which causes Peter Parker to be so stressed that his life suffers because he's always constantly travelling back and forth with medicine and ignoring his other responsibilities. Both stories also feature a blonde attractive girl trying to get Peter Parker's attention despite his distraction. And both ends with Peter Parker reaffirming his identity as Spider-Man, beating a villain, and Aunt May gets better. However, where Spidey Strikes Back presented his repetitive decline in a more comical way, as everyone in New York, from Daredevil to the Avengers to random bystanders childishly assumed he's a coward, is literally like playground logic. In contrast, If This Be My Destiny focuses on Peter's personal life instead. His inability to be involved with University Freshers' activities turns those around him from being inviting to 
dismissive. Furthermore, another divergence is how sovereign Spider-Man is. In one story, Johnny Storm and Flash Thompson are there to support him. In the other story, Peter Parker is almost all alone. He teams up with Dr. Connors to create a cure for Aunt May, but Connors doesn't really know what's going on, so Peter Parker's guilt is never shared. Uncle Ben is even referenced, however it's not as dramatic as you think. I've always felt I was partly responsible for the death of Uncle Ben because he was killed by a criminal whom I didn't catch. That partly bit always gets me. The resolution is also different. In Spidey Strikes Back, Aunt May inspires Peter Parker to persevere. She proudly declares, Even though I'm an old woman, I'm not a quitter. A person needs grumption, the will to live to fight. You mustn't worry about me so much, Peter dear. We Parkers are tougher than people think. Afterwards, Spider-Man's reputation is immediately repaired when he fights for the enforcers in public. However, there's no quick fix in If This Be My Destiny as Peter Parker's university life takes several issues to recover and what motivates him is only himself. Spider-Man feels guilty that Aunt May is dying from his radioactive blood after their original blood transfusion and it reminds him of the death of his uncle. Finally, oh my god. Although his motivations don't come from the shame of his memories, but by his momentary faith in himself. When Spider-Man is exhausted, blindly fighting henchmen to the verge of collapse, it is his connection with his superhero name, his persona, that reignites his fire. What's holding him up? How does he keep fighting? I don't know, but it looks like he's getting stronger. I'm Spider-Man. I'm not going to fail. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. Again, it's very Spider-Man homecoming. And the purpose of these two very vastly different tones is to show that with high school being over, there's a loss of safety in Peter Parker's social life. He has to start caring about the people he's with and review the way he sees himself, because otherwise he'll never leave his boyhood. This is why it's important that Gwen Stacy, Mary Jane and Harry Osborn are people he meet in university and why high school must be goofy. Without the difference in tone, you don't see this very specific and relatable development. First it's Aunt May that saves Spider-Man, then it's Spider-Man that saves Peter Parker and Aunt May. This is a story about a boy slowly reaching inside himself and releasing the true scale of his own potential. As a result, Spider-Man is not just a crushing burden here, impeding on Peter Parker's development, but a key. It's why women loved him. As Betty Brandt said, That's what first attracted me to you, Peter. You were so sincere. You were a good student, a hard worker. You even worked after school to make extra money. Or even Johnny Storm's friggin' girlfriend. He's so quiet, so soft-spoken and gentlemanly. He's like a science major at a school and he's so cultured and down to earth. If only Johnny were more like Peter Parker. And finally, it's why Peter Parker went from thinking of good comebacks against Flash to actually saying them every chance he got. In high school, he locked up to the FF, and in university, he looked inwards. Therefore, Peter Parker became someone closer to his heroes, and therefore, on the way, he stirred a similar level of idealism out of those that he's surrounded by. From Liz, from Flash, to even JJ. Am I always to be thwarted, embarrassed by Spider-Man? I hate that costume freak more than I've ever hated anyone before. I'll never be contented while he's free. All my life, I've been interested in only one thing making money, and yet Spider-Man risks his life day after day with no sort of reward. If a man like him is good, a hero, then what am I? I can never respect myself while he lives. Spider-Man represents everything that I'm not. He's brave, powerful, and unselfish. The truth is, I envy him. I, J. Jonah Jameson, millionaire, man of the world, civic leader, I'd give everything I own to be the man that he is, but I can never climb to his level. So all that remains for me is to try to tear him down, because heaven help me, I'm jealous of him. So Spider-Man is effectively the 70s equivalent of the OK Boomer meme. Going back to these original Stan Lee comics made me realize why so many beloved new versions of Spider-Man often directly oppose the philosophy of the Raimi movies, to the extent that we've kind of gotten used to not seeing frickin' Uncle Ben's legacy in any substantial way. He's, not, he's barely even mentioned anymore. And from Spider-Verse to PS4 to MCU Spider-Man, they often all treat Spider-Man as a persona, not as loyalty to the past, but as a form of forward-thinking therapeutic liberation filled with more smiles than tears, where everyone's membership to a greater community is what improves them as individuals, where it's not so much a curse or a burden, but a responsibility with a smile. 
In fact, I'm going to end this study with one of my favourite moments from Stanley's original comics. Peter, sometimes I get the feeling that you're laughing at a secret little joke that's all your own. <laughs> if you keep using that perfume, Betty, I may break down and tell you about it someday. Conception of our role become one. Are you f? Are you holding up like a good Catholic boy? <laughs>